If you want to participate, contact me at ordinarywomenpodcast at gmail.com. I'm sure you have great projects to brag about. You can also follow me and message me on Instagram at ordinarywomenpodcast, on Twitter at ordinarywomenpc, or on Facebook on the page Ordinary Women. Hi everyone, welcome to a new episode of Ordinary Women. I'm welcoming Natasha today. Hi, how are you? Hi Lucy, I'm really good, thank you. Thanks for having me on to your podcast. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited. Thanks for taking the time. Can you start by giving us a quick introduction of yourself, please? Yes, of course. So my name is Natasha Joel. I'm a photographer, or as sometimes we're now called, a lens-based artist, which kind of means I'm a, more of an artist than a commercial photographer. I'm 48 years old, and I was born in the UK in a small town called Carshorton in Surrey, which is just south of London. And I actually lived there for the first 20 years of my life. Um, I'm actually mixed race. My father was from the Punjab in India, and my mother was from Hastings in Sussex. Really interesting. I love what you said about something lens artist. Len, <laughs> a, len, forgot. <laughs> a, a, a lens based artist. So basically, lens based artist. I love that. Yeah, basically, they when people are more like artists than like photographers that you know commercial commercial photographers, we call ourselves lens based artists because. Sometimes I think people may not don't understand the photos, <laughs> so it's <laughs> nice. It's nice to have this option for us because I guess it kind of expresses our freedom to kind of be more creative behind the lens, and maybe a commercial photographer who is kind of maybe more restricted to you know what they need to do from a business point of view. Yeah, completely. I love that it emphasizes that. Yeah, you're an artist, as you were just saying. That's super cool. Um, and can you tell us something unusual about you? Okay, so I think maybe a couple of unusual things about me is I've, I've traveled quite extensively to quite remote places. So I've actually lived with some uh, indigenous groups like far in the jungle, deep in, in Bolivia and also in Colombia. So I think that's maybe a unique thing about me. Um, I've stayed with these groups for like up to a month deep buried in the rainforest um, and a part of these journeys as well I've actually uh, rehabilitated monkeys in the Bolivian Amazon so maybe that would be something I'd like to share. Wow that's amazing that sounds so cool was it part of your photography activity or for completely something else? Working with the indigenous people, um, a lot of it has been for photography projects, um, but the monkeys was like a volunteer position. But in the end, they actually asked me to take um, the photos for their calendar, which is uh, for their charity, because uh, the rehabilitation center is a charity. And um, so I ended up taking lots of photos and portraits of the monkeys as well, which is a fantastic experience. Oh, wow. I can only imagine. That's super cool and definitely unusual. Thank yeah. You <laughs> it's actually amazing, like, how human monkeys are. And it's almost, mm. I felt like I was almost taking portraits of humans. Um, oh, wow. Their expressions and their, their actions and their whole uh, look of in their eyes is, is so human. So I, I kind of got these amazing portraits of monkeys, which kind of have this kind of human kind of element to them wow that must be such an incredible experience <laughs> it really was amazing <laughs> yeah nice um obviously on this podcast we talk a lot about what it's like to be a woman mm -hmm. so i like to start by asking was there a moment or an event in your life when you realized that you are a woman Yeah, I think actually it's quite a sad moment of my life. My mother died when I was eight. And I think that was probably the first time I realized that I was a woman in the fact that I kind of realized I was different from my father. So it was a kind of moment that I realized there were things personal to me, maybe things physically as you're growing up as a, as a child, um, small things like bathing, Um, I was very embarrassed to, to bathe in front of my dad, whereas I wasn't in front of my mum. And I think this was the first kind of realization that, yeah, I'm, I'm a woman. 
I'm so sorry to um for your loss to hear that. Yeah, did you manage to get any other women figure um growing up? Well, actually um my sister. So I had an older sister and actually she became a huge role model for me. Um she was a very inspirational figure to me when I was a child. Um and she was just a very very strong presence in my life but obviously she was fairly young as well so she didn't take the role of my mother at all but she definitely mm. took a, a feminine kind of role model um position in my life uh well i'm glad that you had yeah her to grow up and did you grow up with any other um yeah women role model um not so much in my kind of direct day-to-day -day life um I think when I was younger, a famous role model that I always kind of felt like I related to was Madonna. Um, and one of the reasons I kind of related to Madonna was actually because her mother died when she was a small child as well. And so I kind of had this, I guess as a small, you know, we're talking about an eight or nine year old girl here, had this mm -hmm. kind of connection with her because I felt like maybe she kind of had some kind of understanding of what I was going through. So I, I kind of just became, you know, a young girl that loved Madonna. I bought all of her records. I watched all of her videos. I was a massive fan of her. And I think as I grow, grew older, I realized also actually Madonna is a very, very strong woman and a very, very, very good businesswoman. Um, so it was, I think it was quite a good role model to have, actually, um, because Madonna, you know, she's a very powerful woman, isn't she? She's uh, yeah. I'm very independent and she and she did a lot of quite controversial things in her younger days so an interesting an interesting role model for me yeah super interesting thank you for sharing and do you have any role models today so again i will go back to my sister i think um she's one of my absolute heroes she's a chemotherapy nurse she works in london in one of the uh bigger hospitals in London um, and I think she, she's been a chemotherapy nurse for her whole nursing career and I've just got such an admiration for her consistency, for her dedication and for her work because obviously um, dealing with people in the, that position is not an easy, not an easy line of work so she's, she's definitely one of my biggest heroes. Um, and then maybe other other role models, I don't know, wouldn't say if they're role models, but very kind of inspirations um, would be other photographers, um, other female photographers. There's um, a lady called Brooke Shaden, who I'm a big fan of. I really like her work. Um, and a Japanese artist called Rinko Kawachi. And um, I'm a massive fan of her as well. Um, so I wouldn't say they're role models for me as people, but they are role models for me professionally as artists. Great. I don't know them, but I'll definitely look them up. Great. Thank you for sharing. And do you think that the lack of representation of women in society had an impact on you? I think possibly when I started working in advertising um, in my 20s, it was probably one of the moments I really felt the huge gender divide. Um, the creative departments were always male-dominated, I actually only ever knew one female creative director across 10 or so agencies that I worked in. So I think that became huge for me, the male dominance in the kind of in, in the advertising industry. Um, and I guess later, as I became a photographer as well, um, photography is another very male dominated industry. I mean, there's shocking statistics. I, I can't remember them exactly, but it's something like 93% of photography students are women and only two or three percent of f professional photographers are women so there's definitely something that's not in line there um, but yeah I think it's probably my professional career that I really started feeling that divide. Yeah I didn't know about that uh, statistics that's yeah the gap this gap is absolutely shocking. Yeah it is it is and um, I think as you work more in photography, you, you do see it as well. I mean, it's the most successful photographers are normally male. That's not all of them, of course. There are some hugely successful female photographers. 
but it would be interesting to see the percentages, um, how they how they stack up male against female on that one. Yeah, completely. I'll try to find them percentage to put in the show notes. Thank you so much for sharing. I'd like to jump on kind of the second part of the podcast and talk about a project, achievement, life experience that you have done. Uh, what do you want to tell, talk to us about today? Well, I'd like to kind of start with, I guess, my kind of move to Colombia and why I kind of left London. So as I said, I worked in advertising for a long time in, in London and I just needed a career break and I really wanted to break into photography and art. I kind of also had the passion to go and live in the rainforest. I had kind of, you know, after I'd done this traveling, as I, as I mentioned, with the monkeys and with the volunteering and, and with other groups, I kind of felt passionate about doing kind of an art project in the rainforest. So I think I'd like to start talking about kind of how I started this. Um, I now live in the Colombian rainforest and I do have an arts project. Um, it's called um, Sanctuary Art Studios and I provide fine art photography for homes, offices, hotels, which help kind of enrich and uplift your home and workspace. So the idea behind this is to kind of create a sanctuary for people via the art of photography. Um, it's kind of with the belief of if you nurture your space, your space will nurture you. I love that. That's, yeah, that is so interesting. So why did you start it? So I started the business um, in 2021 and it was just when COVID was kind of hitting. And basically I had a tour business. I, as I said, I um, had a dream to work with photography in the, in the rainforest. So I actually ran a photography tour business for, for many years and it was, it was fairly successful. It was good fun. I have subsequently had a, a daughter so it was becoming slightly more difficult to manage the tours with, with, a, with a young baby. And I was kind of getting a little bit kind of fatigued from the, you know, the tourists and the, and, you know, it's a lot, of, I did a lot of walking. It was, they were quite strenuous tours, quite out in the open in the wild. And I think as well, it was maybe just a little bit too intense with my new daughter. So when COVID hit, we had to close down anyway. And I felt, well, okay, this is a natural step for me because, you know, I think it needed to happen. And I started thinking about, you know, what else I could do. So I started to sell a few prints. And then my best friend said to me, I love the way you're selling prints. Right now with the quarantine, we all need to make our homes a sanctuary. And then I just had this idea. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to sell prints and photography and I want to make people happy in their homes. I want to create a sanctuary for people in their home or workspace so that they, you know, they, they feel good where they are. Um, obviously, this was heightened by the quarantine because we were all shut in. But it had such a nice take up and people were so positive about it and the kind of energy behind it. Plus, they really loved the prints I was producing. Um, so I continued and it just kind of grew and grew and grew and um, I kind of got to where I am today. I'm also a Reiki healer. So I kind of have matched a little bit of my kind of healing interest into the artwork as well, which is why it's kind of this kind of sense of, of creating a healthy and happy space for you. That's so cool. Yeah, and also like combining these two... Yeah, areas of your life into yeah. your main activity. That must be. Yeah, it's been lovely being able to kind of have a more spiritual connection with the artwork and um, have have something that I feel like I'm offering to people rather than just a print. Have a more, you know, a deeper, a deeper feeling, a deeper sensation of, of providing someone something really beautiful for their space and um, something that really kind of can uplift them as well. Yeah, completely. So do you, in your business, so you sell prints? Yeah. And is there then another part to that? Because like you just mentioned, yeah, making these spaces, yeah, like centuries. So like, do you also give help into that? Yeah, I do. I offer like a consultation service as well for people who maybe um, need some advice um, I also have contact with like feng shui specialists 
and um, interior designers who I sometimes work with. Um, and yeah, I also can like look at somebody's space, for example, and recommend what kind of artwork I would think they would like. Obviously, they would give me like a brief as well, something about, you know, what they would like to achieve, what are their objectives um, to achieve of buying this artwork. For example, somebody might like something that's very calming and very soothing, whereas another person might like something that's quite vibrant and energetic. So these obviously all affect the pieces that I would choose for them. And I also offer commissions for anybody that really wants a unique piece and, you know, a completely unique piece for their, for their home or for their workspace. Um, so, yeah, it's great. I love working with clients. I love hearing what they want, what they need. I love learning about their space, why they've, why they've created their space. You know, is it, a, you know, a holiday home could be very different from somebody's office. A doctor's surgery, for example, is also very different from, you know, a restaurant. So every kind of client has their unique needs. And I love working with them to find kind of the solution for their, for their kind of art needs. Yeah, that must be so fulfilling to know that you're, yeah, part of such an important part of someone's life. And creating a home, which is uh, the best thing. <laughs> It is so fulfilling, um, making people happy and enjoy having my artwork on their walls. I think it's probably, you know, one of the most fulfilling things, really, I've, I've probably felt in my, in my career. I can imagine. That's amazing. And so how did you do it? Like, when, yeah, what happened? What are the steps that you took to arrive here? Well, there have been a lot of steps, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> the original concept I had, well, the concept is the same, but the original kind of design, I, I, you know, I started with a very kind of basic website. Now my website's, you know, got various functions. It's very easy to order online. You can pay by card. Everything gets shipped automatically to you. It's absolutely um, kind of a seamless process that obviously took time to develop. Um, the collection and the artwork has obviously taken time to develop, going through archival work and then obviously shooting new work. So combining, combining all of that, um, putting the collections together, finding um, people that help me produce the work. So, you know, very high quality paper, very high quality prints. We're talking about art prints. So, you know, it's a very very specialist world so all of those contacts you know they've taken it's taken a long time to get all of that um, I've worked really hard lots of lots of failing lots of picking myself back up lots of working with somebody realizing it wasn't the quite the right choice um, improving um, researching negotiating developing relationships with suppliers developing relationships with framers um, we've bought some of our framing in-house now. So, yeah, a lot of, lot of development over the last two years, really from when I started the business in 2021, it's, it, it looks completely different now um, from the front end, like the, the services has developed a lot. It's been a fun process, but it's, if looking back, it's, yeah, it's uh, developed a lot of, um, it's improved a lot. It's fantastic. Yeah, that's amazing. Because also, I guess it's like a good sign that it's working, right? Yeah, it's a good sign that it's working. And people generally are really positive about the kind of ethos behind the project. Mm. And um, I think for me, it's really important to give, give something back, not, not just take. So I think like my whole service is about providing, obviously, clients with something very special for them. But then thinking about as well, you know, the my, a lot of my collection is around nature. I live in the rainforest. So with this kind of huge influence in mind and, um, and caring really about our environment and, and thinking of my daughter's future, we actually plant a tree for every print that we sell. So we try and plant a fruit tree if we can. So it kind of produces some kind of food for animals and for people as well. Um, I always think the, the more fruit trees and the more, you know, abundance we can have in our land just helps everyone. Um, more birds come, you have more nature, more um, even people can come and, you know, if they are hungry, they can take a mango from a tree 
and eat it. And I think that's a fantastic thing. So slowly, slowly, we're building up our collection of um, trees that we've planted for the project as well, which is a really lovely thing to do. Yeah, that is so cool. I love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's also, yeah, like the fact that it goes in so many amazing directions. Um, yeah, it's kind yeah. of that feeling of abundance for everybody, if if you can, you know. Mm. And um, I've felt that so much in my business. So many people have stepped in and helped me. I've had so much support. And I feel like, as I say, I think everything is should be like a circle. So, you know, whatever I'm receiving, I like to try and give as much as I can back. I love that. And actually, speaking of all the support, was there anyone important in particular in all of this or like a few people um, in doing it? Well, I think probably the first person who kind of, as I said, one of my best friends, Faye, was the kind of catalyst mm -hmm. to actually start Sanctuary Arts when she mentioned this kind of, I'm so happy that you're creating this sanctuary through your artwork. So she was the kind of one that sparked off the idea. Um, I've had an amazing business coach as well. Her name's Jalen Boyce. She's fantastic. She's from the Academy of Women Entrepreneurs. And she has supported me so much and um, given me so much um kind of, she's given me ideas she's given me tips she's given me like motivation um and she's you know helped me with she has like a, a networking group as well so she's helped me make many many contacts through her networking group so um that's been absolutely fantastic I think she's been pivotal in this And I would say also my husband. My husband's really supported me. He's helped me right from the start. He's always had like a positive and, you know, really good attitude and has really kind of not, I wouldn't say he's pushed me, but it's definitely the wrong term to use, but he's definitely held me up when I've needed to be held up. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. And yeah, I guess especially from your partner, like you you kind of need <laughs> yeah. um, that help from, yeah. And there's just, what, there's just one other woman um, mm -hmm. I'd really like to, to mention. And um, so I haven't mentioned this before, but uh, as you know, I'm a photographer and I've been working with a group of indigenous women here in Colombia for over nine years now, so almost a decade of work. Um, wow. And the leader of these women is another woman who has been absolutely pivotal in, in supporting me in my photography. Um, basically, I started a project with her in 2014, and it took me almost a year to even gain entrance, access to these communities, because they're very closed and they don't really like people from the outside coming in, especially not to take photos and especially not to kind of stay with them, observe, you know, because they are very private communities. Um, I think they've probably been as well kind of taken advantage of before with, you know, people coming in, they take yeah. photos and then they sell them to the press and maybe they don't give the story that was, was meant to have been given. And, and so I think maybe they also feel a bit betrayed sometimes. Um, anyway, I took all these interviews and I, I gave all the information they needed. And, and afterwards, um, suddenly I was given a completely free pass, like a, a carte blanche to enter any community I wanted to take photos at any time I wanted which is a, an amazing kind of achievement I don't know any other photographer who has this so the leader of this group Judith Torres I would say is also a woman who's been pivotal pivotal in my career in helping me gain confidence as a photographer because without this group kind of accepting me and they haven't accepted so many other photographers but they accepted me It gave me an inner confidence of that what I'm doing is, is good, that what I'm doing is in line with, with what I need to be doing. And um, we have created an amazing body of work over this nine years, which I've actually just exhibited. We actually made it into the national press for the exhibition and some curators came and they were very, very excited about the work because they realized that, you know, over nine years, I've got these really intimate, beautiful photos of the group that really no one else has ever achieved. So I would say I'm very proud of that. And I'm very, um, 
I know a lot how Judith has really, really changed my, my photography career from this opportunity. That's amazing. So how did you first meet her? So I met her through a friend of a friend. Um, the original project that she asked me to help her with was to promote the, um, the artisan bags that they make, which is, they're called mochilas. And basically the women, it's a traditional craft that they've had for hundreds of years and it's only um, made by the women. What happens is they're very popular here. They actually became a national emblem of Colombia. So you can imagine they are huge. Every single Colombian has one. But what happens is the, the women from the communities weave the bags, they sell them to a shop and the shop makes like 300, 400% profit. So what was happening is the communities were not getting any income from what they were doing. These bags take, you know, over a month, maybe two months to make per bag. It's a lot of investment. It's a very spiritual process. They're led by dreams. You can only collect the wool, um, shear the sheep in a full moon. And there are so many, you know, specific rules and, and, and processes around the mochila. They're a very complex piece of art, really. So... I, made, I started making this documentary for the women to give them a voice and to show people these mochilas are very, very valuable and this is why they should be priced like this, but not from the shops. They need to be sold directly from the communities because the communities are not making any money. So that was kind of how I got to know her. And then over the nine years, we just became really good friends. And so I'm still continuing to help them with this kind of message. Um, but I've, you know, I'm also collecting other photos as well that I've made along the way with them, um, especially some very kind of intimate and personal portraits. Um, so, yeah, very special time with these women. Yeah, that is so amazing. Is there anywhere anyone can look at this work? Yeah, if you go to my website, which is sanctuaryartstudios.com, you can see the collections there. There's a, a collection called Dreamweaver and you can see um, a, a select few of the photos, which are, which are also actually for sale. That's amazing. Yeah, I'll definitely put that in the show notes. Yeah, that's so cool. So are you then, how do I say that? Do these two things, like your business and working with these women, does it ever overlap? Yes, yeah, so I'm actually now selling some of these photos as some of my fine art prints in the gallery. So they've kind of overlapped in that way because the gallery is all about kind of beautiful healing photos. Um, as these photos are so intimate and beautiful portraits of the women, they have like a natural kind of spiritual um, essence to them. I think as well, all my photos, whether in the kind of the business or you know, other projects, they, they have kind of, I say that all my photos are an intimate portrait of life. And I think one of my specialties as an artist and photographer is I feel very able to get close to people. I'm, I'm an empath. And so I'm very good at reading people. I'm very good at seeing if people are uncomfortable. I'm very good at maybe understanding how they feel. And this understanding of people has really led me to some really amazing friendships and produce some amazing artwork from these friendships because I think people trust me because I am trustworthy and I think that's an energy that's a feeling that you get from somebody and I think that's why as a photographer I am very successful with kind of remote groups and people that aren't always used to deal or don't always like dealing with photographers because As I said, it's photography is a ma very male-dominated business. So, and maybe the maybe some photographers deal with things very differently. I'm quite quiet. I'm very kind of invisible. I don't like to intrude, but I'm kind of an open energy. So, I think that's why a lot of people do really like working with me. Yeah, that makes so much sense, and especially for these communities, um, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, it makes so much sense that they would prefer someone like you. Yeah, that's amazing. It definitely comes down to trust, I think, with a photographer. I think it's a, a very important part of taking photos. If your subject doesn't have trust in you, you'll just see it immediately, I think. And I think that's where these mm. my collection of photos really speaks for themselves because 
many people have said you, you can just see the intimacy between you because you just wouldn't have been able to get those photos otherwise. Wow, that is so amazing. It was a very special experience, yeah, and it has been. It's ongoing, so I mean, it still is. I'm still creating photos with these women. As I said, I was lucky enough to get the kind of approval for a lifetime, so, you know, they, they enjoy having me too. I think sometimes now they've known me for nine years, it's fun having, having me go again. You know, they, they enjoy it. It's, nice. it's like seeing an old friend. Yeah, completely. It must be so special. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> How do they feel about having pictures of themselves in someone else's home? I mean, I don't know if you ever talked with them about that, but... Um, actually, well, I, I don't know if I... Did I mention I exhibited last week? So I had an exhibition of these uh, photos last week and some of the women from the community came and they were really happy. I think for them, it's probably quite surprising and it's probably quite surprising to look at themselves in this kind of artistic way because I guess it's I've captured images that they must see all the time in their day-to-day -day life they see these shadows they see these highlights they see these smiles but I don't know if they've ever seen them in photography so I think it was lovely being with them watching them look at my photos and seeing them smile and seeing their kind of pride in the fact that somebody out from outside of their community has really kind of given so much beauty to their culture and not that I've given beauty to their culture but kind of is demonstrating the the beauty and the the um, intimacy of their culture which maybe they haven't seen before but I haven't asked them how they would feel about being on somebody else's wall it's a really good question I think I'll ask them yeah well let me know <laughs> I will I'm really curious about that I am now too as well actually it's a really fantastic question I'm gonna, gonna ask them. <laughs> I'll let you know. Thank you. <laughs> That is so cool. And what challenges have you faced, either with your business or working with them? Feel free to answer the question however you want. Okay, so I think like, and this is actually something they, the community helped me with. I, I've always suffered with low confidence and I've always suffered with imposter syndrome. So it's kind of a constant battle of fear and rejection and I'm not good enough, who am I? I don't really, uh, am I really a photographer? Am I really an artist? You know, do I know anything? And because I had this kind of pass from the women, they gave me such confidence to, to work with them. Uh, I think through the, these photographs, I began to realise, no, I'm actually a really qualified and, and skilled photographer and I am actually producing work that, I would be proud, to, you know, any magazine would be proud to publish. So I think that was kind of an interesting relationship that we developed because through the nine years of working with them, they've kind of helped me get rid of my imposter syndrome, which does creep back in quite, not frequently, but now and again, it does creep back in. So that the project has helped me a lot with my confidence, but I would say probably confidence is totally my biggest challenge. Yeah, that's so fair. And yeah, I guess especially coming back to what we were talking about at the beginning, having few women photographers mm -hmm. must not be helpful in that sense. No. Um, yeah, but yeah, at the same time, yeah, especially this, well, I, as you were just saying, the, the trust these women put in you might be like, yeah, the best, I don't know, reminder of how great you are. Yeah, it's been really... Um... I think it's just that, as you said, it's that trust, I guess. And I guess it's the trust they've had in me and the trust I've had in them that's made this kind of the whole thing work so well. Yeah. And was there something that was easier than you thought it would be? Um, I think maybe getting like people on board with my project. Like, so, for example, I sell to hotels and um The idea is that, that, that their hotel guests can also buy the artwork because I, they can buy it from my online gallery. So I was quite nervous about speaking to hotel owners about this, but I was, I was amazed that kind of everyone I've spoken to said yes immediately to the project um, to basically have my artwork in their hotels and offer it to clients um, to take home with them. But as I say, not, not to take the actual frame home with them, They can order a copy of the print online and get it delivered to their home, which is great for tourists because they can't take 
artwork home. You can't take a huge frame yeah. home in your backpack or, you know, you, it's, yeah. I mean, Colombia doesn't even have a national postal service, really. So you can't even go to the post office and post it even if you wanted to. But um, yeah, so that was amazing, like just to see people, like, the hotel owners be like, yeah, this is an amazing concept. We love it. Yeah, definitely get us on board. So yeah, again, that's a confidence thing, probably. I didn't imagine it to be easy, but when it, when it came to it, people are super positive. That's amazing. Like, I loved how, yeah, sometimes you're just like, oh, what will people think? And people are like, no, that is so cool. Let me be part of this as much as I can. Yeah, it's, fant it's a fantastic feeling. Yeah. And why are you proud of all of this? Um, I think I'm probably proud of the artwork I've produced. I look and look at my collection now and I can see, you know, that there's a lot of work that's gone into my my artwork. There's a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of learning. A lot of my photography, you know, the shots are not easy to achieve. I play with the camera. I use very kind of technical things on the camera that maybe a, a non-photographer would not know how to do. So I'm really kind of, I think I'm really proud of that, how much I've achieved um, in the last kind of 10 years in developing my photography skills um, with the camera, with Photoshop, with everything. So I think that's something I'm proud of. I'm proud of being consistent. I'm proud of sticking at my dream. I'm proud of not giving up. I'm proud of continuing, continuing to learn. And I'm proud of kind of still having my passion I don't think I could ever stop taking photographs. It's kind of part of me. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think we're going to conclude our episode on this. Okay. Thanks for your time for sharing all of this. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, again, yeah, I'll put everything in the show notes. So highly encourage everyone to go and look at all of your art. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Is there anything we haven't talked about and you wanted to mention before we end? Um, no, I think I've covered everything off. I think maybe I would just say to anybody who is, you know, wanting to start as an artist or is in the middle of a, a career as an artist, just to, you know, you have to keep going. And there is a tradition in this podcast that the guest gets the very last word. So the mic is yours. Okay, so I would just say if there are any other budding photographers or artists out there, um, keep going, keep experimenting, keep making the work that you love and um, get out there and share it with the world as soon as you can. <laughs>